It was August 1943, in occupied France. On a small Luftwaffe airfield, Oberlieutenant Vera Schultz, a technical officer from Jagdgeschwader 26, received news that immediately drew attention. An American P-47 Thunderbolt had been forced down. The pilot was captured, and the aircraft itself, remarkably, was almost completely intact. To German engineers, this was gold. For months, Luftwaffe pilots had been reporting encounters with a new kind of American fighter. It was enormous, oddly shaped, and seemed to take unbelievable punishment in combat. Now, for the first time, they had one right in front of them. When Schultz first saw the aircraft sitting on the tarmac, his first thought was the same as everyone else's. It looked ridiculous, big, fat, and clumsy, like it shouldn't even fly. Pilots had already given it a nickname, the Flying Milk Bottle. But Schultz wasn't a pilot. He was an engineer, a man who trusted numbers, data, and metal. And once he began his inspection, he realized what he was looking at wasn't grotesque. It was terrifying. He started with the engine. The cowling came off, and there it was, the Pratt & Whitney R820 Double Wasp. Schultz had never seen anything like it. Eighteen cylinders, arranged perfectly in two rows of nine. The whole unit was enormous, clean and precise. Every part looked like it had been built without compromise. He studied the metal, the machining, the tolerances. Everything was flawless. German factories under constant bombing and resource shortages could no longer maintain this level of precision. Yet the Americans were clearly mass-producing engines like this. Schultz ran calculations in his notebook. This engine was easily producing over 2,000 horsepower. The best German fighter engine, the BMW 801 in the Focke Wolf 19, could manage maybe 1,700 at maximum output, and even that pushed German technology to the limit. But the real surprise came when Schultz examined the network of pipes and turbines running through the fuselage. It was the turbo supercharger system something Germany had tried to build but failed. The Americans had perfected it. The exhaust gases from the engine were routed to a turbine in the rear of the plane. That turbine spun a compressor at speeds over 20,000 revolutions per minute, forcing air back into the engine. The result was simple but devastating. Full power at high altitude. German fighters lost performance above 25,000 feet. The P-47, on the other hand, only got stronger the higher it climbed. It could fight where the air was thin, where German aircraft gasped for oxygen. When one of Schultz's assistants asked if Germany could replicate the system, Schultz shook his head. The materials, the precision machining, the time, it was all beyond reach. Germany was already struggling to build basic fighters. After the engine, Schultz examined the airframe. The aircraft had taken heavy damage before its forced landing. Cannon holes scarred the fuselage. The wings were riddled with bullet marks. And yet, somehow, it had still flown home. The P-47's construction was brutally strong. Thick aluminum skin, solid internal framing, and redundant systems everywhere. It wasn't elegant. It was built to survive. Compared to the light, agile German fighters, this thing was a tank. The radial engine itself acted like armor. Unlike German liquid-cooled engines, which would fail instantly if the cooling system was punctured, the P-47's air-cooled engine could lose several cylinders and still run. There were even reports of Thunderbolts returning to base with holes through the engine and still making it home. Schultz's team looked at each other in disbelief. This wasn't over-engineering. It was a different philosophy entirely. The Americans weren't chasing elegance or optimization. They were designing for endurance, for production, 
for war. And then came the armament. Eight heavy Browning .5 caliber machine guns, four in each wing, each with 400 rounds. That was more than 3,000 rounds of ammunition. Together, the guns could fire over 100 rounds per second. A single one-second burst could put a hundred armor-piercing slugs into an enemy aircraft. Two seconds, two hundred. Against lightweight German fighters, it was pure destruction. The P-47 didn't need perfect aim, it just needed to get close and pull the trigger. Schultz noted that German aircraft carried far less firepower, usually two machine guns and one or two cannons, with limited ammunition. Once a German pilot emptied his belts, he had to return to base. The American pilot could stay in the fight for much longer. He began to see the pattern. Every part of this plane, engine, airframe, armament, reflected one thing, industrial power. The Americans could afford to build things heavier, stronger, and more complex because they had the factories, the manpower, and the materials. Schultz requested production figures from intelligence sources, and the numbers left him stunned. Republic Aviation was building more than 500 P-47s a month and increasing. By comparison, Germany's entire fighter output from all factories combined was barely 300 to 400 per month. Then he saw engine data. The R820 wasn't just used in the P-47, it powered other American aircraft as well. Total production would surpass 125,000 engines before the war ended. In that moment, Schultz understood the real war wasn't in the skies, it was in the factories. America was producing aircraft three times faster than Germany, and each American plane was more complex, more powerful, and built with better materials. When Schultz finished his report, he didn't sugarcoat anything. He wrote that the P-47 represented a level of industrial and technological sophistication Germany couldn't match. He warned that continued attrition would destroy the Luftwaffe. When his commanding officer read it, he nodded slowly. You know they won't like this in Berlin, he said. Schultz knew. The Nazi leadership didn't want truth. They wanted reassurance, victory speeches, not data showing that Germany was falling behind. His report was sent up the chain. Weeks later, Schultz heard it had been dismissed as defeatist, filed away with no action taken. One official even claimed Schultz had been influenced by enemy propaganda. He wasn't surprised. The regime had always rejected uncomfortable truths. Ideology mattered more than engineering. In the months that followed, Schultz watched his predictions come true. The P-47s appeared in greater numbers, the sky over Europe filled with them. German pilots reported hopeless encounters, attacks from above, thunderous gunfire, and American planes that refused to fall. Then came the P-51 Mustang, even faster and with longer range. Schultz examined one later. It carried a Packard-built version of the British Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, another example of America's vast industrial reach. Everything he saw confirmed his belief. Germany was losing not just a military war, but an industrial one. By the time the war ended, Schultz had survived. When American intelligence officers interviewed him, they asked if it was true that one captured plane had convinced him Germany would lose. He replied, yes, the P-47 showed me that we could not win an industrial war. Every bolt, every weld, every system proved it. The American officer told him they had found his original report. It had been marked, filed, no action required. 
Schultz just smiled bitterly. I expected that, he said. They didn't want truth. They wanted belief. After the war, when production numbers were made public, Schultz realized he had underestimated the scale. The United States had built more than 300,000 aircraft during the war. Germany had produced fewer than 100,000. America had built over 15,000 P-47s alone, more than all BF-109s and FW-190s combined. Factories that once made cars were turned into aircraft plants. Companies like Ford and Chevrolet built aircraft engines. While German factories struggled with shortages and bombings, American assembly lines ran day and night. The quality never dropped. The machines kept coming, strong, reliable, and endless. Schultz later reflected that the war was never truly decided by tactics or bravery. It was decided by industry, by who could build more, faster, and better. Germany's leadership believed ideology could overcome mathematics. They believed willpower could replace steel and speeches could replace oil. They were wrong. Schultz had seen the truth in 1943, the moment he walked around that captured thunderbolt. It wasn't just a fighter plane. It was a message, a symbol of a nation's power to build, to supply, and to endure. He realized then that Germany had already lost a war it didn't yet understand. Not a war of pilots and bullets, but a war of factories and machines. A war where numbers, not ideology, decided who would rule the skies.